Welcome to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. Good to see you guys here this morning in the house and online. Thank you for being with us as we walk through Luke chapter 12 in God's Word, and we look at each week what Jesus Christ himself has to teach us about our possessions, about the future, and about our worry and our anxiety. So we're going to dive into Luke chapter 12 in verses 32 through 34 here this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a friend who has lived here in South Florida his entire life. And this guy's a very sharp guy, a very articulate guy. And uh, he had mentioned a piece of property that we're both familiar with that had recently been purchased. And the purchaser was going to build a house on the land. And my buddy made a comment that I had not thought about because I'm not from South Florida. He said, before they build, they're going to have to demuck the land. Because here in South Florida, if you're not from here, you may not know, but we have something called muck. And muck is what is essentially below the water in a swamp. Uh, Even where we're standing right here is is, uh, recently back as the 1980s, this area, I mean this room, this worship center was basically swamp. Some of you guys remember Okeechobee Boulevard was uh, basically just a dirt road and it ended at State Road 7 for our locals. So in order to build something here in South Florida, you have to scoop out all of the muck, which if you try to build a foundation on top of this uh, swamp material, your structure and your home or your house, whatever you want to build, even roads, will eventually collapse because the muck cannot serve as a base for a foundation. He said what you have to do is you have to remove all of the swamp muck and replace it with good soil. And what we're going to see here this morning from the words of Jesus Christ that to build something that will last, let's get personal, to build a life that will last to where unlike the rich fool earlier in Luke chapter 12 who lived his entire life seeking to gain security from his stuff to where he became possessed by his possessions, Jesus says think more long term, think strategically, live your life with a plan and the plan is greater than becoming debt free. The plan is greater than simply getting to the legacy stage of our business to where we can sit back and relax. Jesus is saying, live your life for the glory of God. And in these verses, we're going to see how Jesus gets down into the instability that we all have that emanates and flows out from and exudes from a place of fear about the future. We're going to see how Jesus counsels us on steps to take in our lives regarding the future. So we're going to look this morning about fear and fathers. And here's our main idea. Good fathers give their children good gifts. So let's read Luke chapter 12, beginning in verses 32 through 34. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where thief, no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Then in verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So these are the words of Jesus about in the face of fear and anxiety steps to take. Notice there in verse 32, he begins with a a command to his disciples, fear not. And notice how he designates his disciples. And this is a group of men. He says, fear not, little flock. This is the only place in God's word to where Jesus refers to his disciples specifically like this. Jesus is getting into uh, the caverns of the heart. Jesus is getting into where they were and where honestly many of us have been or maybe that's where we are today to where we have an overwhelming sense of fear. Sometimes we can't even put a face on the fear. We can't put a name. We can't put a particular situation. But we just have these incredible fears about the future that can cripple us from walking in a way that helps us know God better. But notice how Jesus qualifies his command to not fear. Why should we fear not? Because we have a good 
Father. Notice verse 32, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus is telling his disciples that in the midst of fear in your life, remember the character of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've turned from your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, remember that it's not just the character of God, but it is the relationship that God has with you. That God called us out of darkness into light. He called us from a way of death to a way of life. He called us out of a purposeless existence to a life of meaning and purpose. He called us off of the road to hell onto the road to glory, onto the road to knowing him and helping other people know him. So brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that the pivotal point, according to one Bible scholar and commentary, of Jesus' instruction, listen, is theological. Jesus is saying the antidote to a life to where we are crippled by fear is to remember the goodness of God, to remember who God really is, and to remember if you're a follower of Christ, his relationship and his, his uh, posture towards you. Now, I, as many of you know, we have two sons, and uh, I am far from a perfect father. I pray all the time, Lord, help me become who I need to be, what I need to be to point my boys towards you. But Jesus had given an illustration in other passages of God's word uh, saying that uh, if any of you have a child who asks for a piece of bread, would you, give him, uh, would you give him a stone? And if he asked for a fish, would you give him a snake? Absolutely not. Jesus gives this uh, reductio absurdum type of argument. Jesus says, if you then being evil, so he's pointing to all, everyone there, he's saying, if you then being evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more your father in heaven. So I want you guys to know that I am far from a perfect father, but I want to give good things, healthy things, fun things to my boys. Currently, they're in the stage of life where they are absolutely enamored with uh, machines of any sort. They love riding on the tractor. That's what they call the riding mower. They love, um, they love the weed eater. They love, uh, they love the, the uh, the leaf blower, and so the other week they were wanting to do all that, so we just got on the riding mower, and we turned on the weed eater, and then we uh, turned on the leaf blower, and we just drove around the yard, and uh, the little guy right there in the middle wanted to be in control. That is why his ex expression is that way, but we just had a great time, and I want them to have fun in an appropriate way. I want them to, to enjoy life. I want them to have what they need, and if Jeff Robinson, as fallen as he is, and as needy for God as he is, wants to help his children have a good time and enjoy their life. Jesus is saying your heavenly father is a million times greater than any half decent dad. So when you have fear, remember your heavenly father. Well, what does God want to give? Notice he says, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you the kingdom of God. And my goodness, is, is that not an exciting part of God's word to study? Jesus uh, teaches often about the kingdom of God. And theologians through the years have described what is the kingdom of God. It is in part the now. It, it is Christ reigning in our hearts. It is Jesus Christ becoming Lord of people who become followers of Christ. But it is also, and this is the big one, it is the not yet. The kingdom of God is, is working throughout the world and changing lives. But the kingdom of God ultimately with all caps, with bold, will be instituted at the end of time with the second coming of Christ and all that happens in the end times and the eschaton and so forth. But Jesus says that your father wants to give that to you. Now, can you imagine the headline article, Little Flock Receives Kingdom? I want you to notice the, the, the position there. Jesus is talking to, again, a group of his disciples, and he calls them Little Flock. I've never heard a college 
football coach. I've never heard an NBA coach just saying, gather around, little flock. No, it's like, come on, let's go. Let's take this out. Let's beat the other team. Let's win. Jesus gathers them together because he knew the hearts of men. And he knew that there was fear in the hearts of his disciples about the future. And Jesus is saying, even though you're a little flock, even though you're a sheep and we all can go astray from time to time, he's saying that it is your Father's will to give you the kingdom of God. So in the face of times of anxiety and worry, Jesus leads us to remember that over 200 times in God's word, it is the command to fear not. And secondly, in verse 33, we see Jesus leading these disciples to live and walk in a system, in a lifestyle, or you could say a rhythm of generosity. Notice verse 33. Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Jesus is saying uh, the command here is, is rather obvious to give to those who are in need. Now, some of us would say, well, of course, we should give to those who are in need, but the order of the day, giving was often, in the Greco-Roman world, giving was so that I can call on that person that I gave the gift to later on for a favor. All right, you tracking with that? In the Greco-Roman world, especially outside of the people of God, giving was um, an opportunity to get in good with the people that you're giving to, so maybe you've got an opportunity with them later on. It's like I scratch your back, then you scratch mine. And then there were, there was even within uh, the Jewish community in the first century there in Palestine, there were, (laughs) it had come to the point to where even at the temple, people would give to show off. There was a, a procession and people would come and they would have their offering. And in that day and time, they didn't have cash. So if you carried around a lot, of, uh, a lot of money, you had to work out. Like you couldn't carry around a lot of money and not go to the gym. And people would give and those coins would fall into the coffers. And the more you gave, the longer you were there pouring out your offering and everybody could see. And that's why Jesus says, don't give your alms, don't give your offerings before other people to be noticed, but do your utmost to be, uh, to be wise and give to God. Be wise, but don't seek to be noticed. So when Jesus says, give to the needy, he's saying, be different than what we could call the subversive philanthropy of Jesus' day. Which again, whether it was in um, the people of God in that community or outside in the Gentile world, there was so much um, uh, giving to get. And Jesus is saying, give, give wisely, but give with no strings attached. Don't give with an ulterior motive. And the needy were obviously many of those who were in Jesus' audience beyond the disciples specifically. The majority of Jesus' listeners were not rich people of the day. And even Jesus' disciples included fishermen, which um, some commentators believe that they were somewhat middle class. One of Jesus' disciples was a tax collector, which would be your white collar. And Jesus even had Simon the Zealot, who was a political extremist, along with others. There was so much diversity in the background of Jesus's disciples. But most people in Jesus's time had a lack of material goods. And there's also the spiritually poor. If you want to take notes in Luke chapter 4 and verses 16 through 21, Jesus was there in the synagogue reading from uh, Isaiah chapter 61 when God had, uh, had put him there to proclaim good news to the poor. There is a sense in the New Testament that yes, the church is to be concerned for those who have a lack of material goods, but ultimately Jesus came to preach the good news to those who had a spiritual poverty. And often the correlation, even in the 21st century, can be this, that when we do well, we can have the tendency to forget God. One of the most dangerous places to be is to be financially successful to where we don't think that we need God. And again, Jesus is following this commentary right off of his parable about the rich fool. And that's the mindset that that guy had, uh, had uh, come into. 
And Jesus tells us again in verse 33, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. What he's saying here is, is invest in lasting returns. You're like, okay, now hold on, that, that, that sounds a little unusual. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. Like, is Jesus telling me to start an Etsy shop? Like, what's going on? No, what Jesus is doing here is Jesus is pointing our attention to a greater treasure. Jesus is not banning private possessions. What Jesus is doing is saying, get, be to a point in your life and in your walk with God to where you are not resting in your possessions. Just a bit of context. Jesus and his disciples, they even had a money bag. They had a bank account. This is in John chapter 13, verse 29. And when Jesus was on the cross in John chapter 19, verse 27, Jesus said to the disciple John about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus is there on the cross. He loves his mother so much that he wants her to be taken care of. And he says, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple John took her, Mary, into his home. So John the Apostle still had a house when Jesus was even on the cross. So Jesus is not banning Christians from having private possessions or, or, or money. What Jesus is getting at the heart of this entire chapter is don't allow your possessions to possess you. Don't allow the allure of getting a certain amount of possessions to possess you. And the context is what? Jesus is not talking necessarily to lazy people. Jesus is talking to people who struggle with worry. A Bible scholar named Walter Liefeld says it this way. It is not the extent, but the place of one's possessions. And we're going to see how Jesus explains that here in verse 33. He says, With a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth, destroys. What Jesus is saying is don't, again, live your life for the accumulation of stuff, thinking that enough stuff will one day provide security. Jesus is saying, live your life in such a way to where you invest your time, your talent, and your treasure into people and leading people to know who Jesus Christ is. This treasure in the heavens does not fail. No thief. It's where we get the word kleptomaniac. No klepto. Uh, no moth that would eat through the clothing or eat through the money bag so that it could no longer hold the money. We could say it this way in South Florida. Uh, with a treasure in the heavens, when we invest our time, our talent, and our treasure into the kingdom of God, it's where no dry wood termite or subterranean termite or no water intrusion or no, a leaky roof, what a hurricane can't touch or, or uh, uh, inflation can't touch or a flood or a tornado or economic fluctuation. Jesus is saying in order for your investment to last, it can't just be here. And notice in verse 34, where Jesus leads his disciples to consider realigning their heart with their treasure and the source of hope. Notice verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you've been at Grace for any amount of time, we have touched on this a number of times, but I want you to consider how profound Jesus' words are here. Jesus is literally saying that where our stuff is, where our investments are, where that, that's where our focus of our heart, that's where our affections are. I mean, just think about the, the, the hobbies that some of us have. It's not bad to have a hobby. It's not wrong to have a vehicle. But if you really enjoy something, you like it. And your heart goes out to it and you think about it. Jesus is saying here that no matter where the treasure is, the heart always follows the treasure. And so he's saying Shift the object of your hope from possessions to the character and the nature of your heavenly Father. And some of us would say, okay, well, Pastor Jeff, I, I get that, but how do I actually seek out the right treasure? How do I develop, we could say, rhythms 
of generosity? How, how do I, how, what steps should I take, can I consider to begin the process of my heart being where I really want it to be? How, how, what, what are some ways that I can go about living my life to where I don't have to be dominated by that fear of the future? Well, number one, be honest with and about your fears. Be honest with God about your fears about the future. And I would say this, for those of us that have the struggle with um, what if, that's the way we always think. We say, what if this, what if that? Here's what I would encourage you to consider. For every what if that comes into your mind and your heart, answer Jesus' question from uh, Matthew chapter 16, but who do you say that I am? You say, but, but, but what if this and what if that? The bigger question from Jesus is who do you say that I am? Answer the what if with a who. Because brothers and sisters, if Jesus Christ is who he said he was, then he's got you then he's going to take care of you. Then he, he cares more for us, if we back up to last week's message, than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. He's your heavenly father if you're a follower of Christ. He knows the struggle. He knows the fears. And sometimes, guys, we can't help when fear and anxiety attack us. So we don't seek that out. We don't want that. But sometimes it just hits. In those moments when the what-ifs seem to constrict around our courage and choke out the spiritual life in our hearts, just answer Jesus' question. Who do, you really, who do you really believe that I am? Who do you say that I am? And you can have the opportunity to preach God's word to your heart own heart. And you can have that conversation with the Lord to say, Lord, I'm, I'm afraid about the future. I mean, this is, you know, 2020 and, and coming to the end of the month of October and all of what, you know, can transpire. Lord, I'm afraid. Go to him. Say, Lord, what about this? I know I'm thinking about the what ifs, but I want to focus upon who you are. And what you will find is that often incrementally you begin to have a lessened sense of crippling worry and an increasing trust and confidence in who Jesus Christ is. Because Jesus said a couple of verses ago, it was the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And secondly, to create rhythms of generosity in your life, give when God gives to you. This is a foundational, it's a freeing concept, really. But there's a roadblock to generosity, and the roadblock in many forms can be this. Lord, let me get secure in my life first, and then I will build in rhythms of generosity. But Lord, I have to be secure first. And there is a certain sense in which we always want to be wise about our time, our talent, our treasure, our investments, how we spend our money. But brothers and sisters, let's remember what Jesus told us back in verse 15, that the substance of our life does not come from what we are currently possessing. You see, that's the lie of materialism. That's the lie of stuff. That if I, just, if I just get a little bit more, then I'll be ready to serve the Lord. Where Jesus comes into the scene, Jesus says, first things first. If this is a new concept to you uh, as a follower of Christ, or maybe if you're just investigating Christianity, when we say that... Um, God calls us to a life of faith. We don't mean uh, blind faith that's often uh, represented in popular films. That, that, that's a distortion of what faith is. Biblical faith is not a blind leap in the dark, but a step based upon evidence. And it goes like this. If I believe that there's evidence for the existence of God, if I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, if I have placed my confidence in him, and if he has done all of that, if he's created the cosmos, if he keeps it going, and if he came to live, die, and be resurrected from the dead, that's a tall order. If I, can believe, if I can believe that, if I can have confidence in that to the point that I repent of my sin and place my faith in him and in him alone, and he's asking me to just live a life of generosity, to begin to build in a rhythm 
of generosity in my life. Something practical like whenever God gives to me, I give. It seems to be an easy request if God exists and if Jesus rose from the dead. But that's where, again, to go back to verse 32, Jesus says, fear not. The reason why some of us struggle with whether it's tithing, uh, which is to give 10% of our income to our local church so that that gospel outpost, that forward operating base can be strong and then give above and beyond that as God leads us. So the reason why some of us struggle with that is not necessarily out of greed like the rich fool, but it's out of fear. And Jesus says, fear not. And if God can give the kingdom of God to the believers and we are in his family, then he will be able to take care of us. So this is very granular. This is very detailed. This is very uh, steps oriented. A way to begin to build rhythms into your life is to protect, is to practice the first things first principle as opposed to Let me become secure, and then I'll begin to develop a life of generosity. And number three, give proportionally. I would encourage you to start giving. Uh, If you're a follower of Christ, this is an integral part of your discipleship. Uh, Some will call it a spiritual discipline. But there are numerous testimonies all across just this church, Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations here in West Palm Beach, Florida, of people who have said, Pastor Jeff, I wasn't raised in a home where we did that. I've never really thought about that, but it actually makes sense to me that if God uh, is who he says that he is and he calls me, I mean, he, he owns it all, but he calls me uh, to, to, to return to him and return to his work uh, a portion of what he allows me to have, then it's a step of faith that I'm growing in. And every time the Lord gives to me, now I'm giving and I see my faith increasing and I see God confirming that he will take care of me. And then finally, it's a question that we looked at last week. And this is one of the most foundation, foundational questions that we could ever ask in life. And it's this again. Do you think that Jesus knows what he's talking about? I mean, this is, this is the most significant question in our life. The answer to this question determines what we will do with Jesus. Do I really believe? And I want to talk to our followers of Christ. Obviously, this is who it applies to. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, you're trying to figure out who Jesus is. But if you're a Christian, do I really believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth, really knows what he's talking about? And some of us may have in our heart and our mind, we may not say this out loud, but say, Pastor Jeff, do you not understand when we are? Like, do you not get, like, 2020, do you not understand that, like, this is, this is um, a pandemic year? Do, do you not understand that we're, like, you know, less than two weeks away at this point of a, a historic election and all of what everybody on every side and every angle thinks the what ifs of what could happen. Do you not understand when we are, Pastor Jeff? And those thoughts and those fears can sometimes be a conversation like this with the Lord Jesus. We may not say it this way, but it's, Jesus, I know what you said, but you see, Jesus, times have, times have changed since you said these words. So don't you think your words are up for an update? Now, if you're a follower of Christ, that's likely not something that you would say. But the what ifs that can keep us where we are as opposed to following Jesus on where he wants to take us, it can be crippling. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to remember that even though times have changed, people fundamentally have not changed. Whether 3,000 years ago, during the time of King Solomon, or here in South Florida, where we have to demuck the land that our, that our domiciles are built upon, we've always struggled as people with trying to achieve security through stuff. Times have changed. But people fundamentally struggle with the same things. And praise be to God, he has not changed. 
the Father, the good Father, the one who desires to give his children good gifts, the gifts that they need so that their joy, not so that their temporary circumstantial happiness would be full, but so that their joy, that deep abiding sense of satisfaction in life would be bursting at the seams and flowing over. That same God is still alive today. So I just want to encourage you to consider if we believe that Jesus knows what he's talking about, then let's ask ourselves, is there a rhythm of generosity in my life regarding my possessions and if not it may be the right step for us to say you know what I get that times have changed but I want to believe and I I understand deep down even though my fear sometimes is getting in front of my vision I believe that there is the one true God who has redeemed me and who has saved me and who has sustained me and I believe that he is able to continue to give me what nothing else can which is ultimate security. Daryl Bach, an incredible New Testament scholar, said this. He said, the call of God will never take us to a place where the grace of God cannot sustain us. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus is pointing out that no matter who we are, whether we come from a money background or not, whether we're upper class, middle class, struggling class, No matter whether we're in debt or we have no debt, no matter how our portfolio is doing or whether we've never even thought of having a portfolio in our life, Jesus is saying, fear not. Jesus is pointing out and identifying for the disciples once again and for us as well as believers that it may be on a constant basis that we need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to demuck our hearts for his kingdom to be built inside us, for him to be reigning and ruling and operating in our lives, there needs to be some stuff that's removed. And I think for many of us, that's according to Jesus, and that's with his disciples. It's fear that needs to be removed, and he can replace that when we take him at his word and we build in rhythms of generosity in our life. He will replace our fear with an increasing confidence that he will take care of us. May the Lord bless you and know that we love you. You will always be more than enough for me. You will always be more than enough for me. Nothing's gonna stop the plans you made. Nothing's gonna take you for being with us today at Grace Online. As we continue our new series, Legacy of Grace, over the next several weeks, we'll be addressing life-changing truths from Luke chapter 12 in God's Word. If you're ready to follow Jesus, or if you want to be baptized by immersion, if you need prayer or simply have a question about God's Word, let us know by filling out the online connect card and we will reach out to you. You can also help others by simply sharing this content. After the service as well, I want to encourage you, take some time and pray for those with you. If you're alone, reach out to someone else and ask how you can pray for them. Finally, if you're a member or a regular attender and you wish to give, you can do so by clicking the give link below. May the Lord bless you and we look forward to seeing you next week at Grace Online.